Come to the place where abundant lives abide. Come to the place where you will find new life. We, we've been in this, in this uh, fifth chapter uh, dealing with uh, Belshazzar. And uh, let's, let's go. I'm not going to do any review because then I'll be on this two more weeks. So I'm going to jump right in <laughs> at where I left off uh, last week. So Belshazzar had this great feast. One of these Sundays I'm going to preach on that feast. A great big party. And Bible parties were, were epical. You remember that uh, Esther became queen at a party. You remember when... Uh, uh, Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus was having this big party and he called Vashti uh, and Vashti wouldn't come and so he deposed her and got another queen. So Bible parties, you remember it was at a party that John the Baptist lost his head because uh, the dancing daughter, uh, stepdaughter really of, of Herod uh, asked for the head of John the Baptist at the behest of her mother um, so parties were pivotal in the Bible, and, and they knew how to have parties that could last weeks at the time. So, but after Belshazzar sent for the vessels that came out of the house of God, uh, uh, the fingers of a man's hand began to write on the wall. We're going to pick up the story in verse 24. And this is the writing that was written. Meeny, meeny, tekel sin. Meaning, meaning, tikel yufar sin. So, so uh, Daniel was brought in by the queen to read this writing, and uh, the king offered him all kinds of uh, uh, purple and gold and authority. He did not want it because the one thing that I want you to remember, and don't forget this. When you come, remember we talk about the two kingdoms, and I do not think you can adequately preach about the kingdom of God without referencing and acknowledging the existence of the other kingdom. But we must understand our relationship to those other kingdoms. Listen, the kingdom of the saints, I mean the power of the saints, and the prosperity of the saints doesn't come from that other kingdom. I'll say that again. Do you know what's really wrong with the church today in many cases? We are borrowing from the world its, 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 its prestige and its authority. That's not where our authority comes from. The earth is the world and, and that's happening to us. Uh, a lot of us preachers are beginning to model our ministries after worldly, I'm going to make up a word, celebrityism. There's something wrong with that. Because that's not where we get our authority. God gives us authority. And God gives us prosperity. And God gives us what we have. So you cannot use the authority of the world in the kingdom of God. Now, it's not true the other way. I'll say that again. You cannot use the authority of the world in God's kingdom, but you can use God's kingdom in the authority in the world. You see it? In other words, we should not look to anybody in the world to affirm us. Anybody to endorse us. Anybody to tell us that we're okay. Who tells us we're okay? God tells us we're okay. Our relationship with God establishes who we are. And we have to teach that to our children. When we teach our girls, they don't need some boy to affirm them. And if you let somebody tell you because you're single what's wrong with you, you should ask them what's wrong with you. Marriage doesn't affirm me. God affirms me. The car I drive, the house I live in, all those things are nice, but they don't affirm you. Don't use worldly methods to affirm you. Well, I know I'm a great preacher. I have a big church. Not necessarily. Gain is not what? Godliness. A lot of stuff doesn't mean God is in it. Sometimes God is in places we don't expect. Abraham told, Abraham told those kings, I don't want your stuff. 
I don't want to shoot at you from you. Watch this. Lest you say, I made Abraham rich. In the 50th or 55th Psalm, somewhere in there, God said, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to mine. The beast of the field. Watch this. And if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Our authority, our blessing, and I'll be dealing with this Sunday, we need not be anxious, it come, and we must not run after and seek after the approbation of the world in order to approve us. You know what the Bible says? The Bible actually says friendship with the world is enmity against God. Did you know that? So, so he said, I don't want your stuff, but I'll tell you what it means. Meaning, meaning, tell you for our sin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Meaning, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, the kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Listen. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and a proclamation. And Daniel said, I told you, what? I didn't want this. But at this point, he thought he could possibly buy God's favor. Because, watch this, we're going to have to stop, listen to me carefully, we're going to have to stop letting the world pass judgment on the church. You need to stop sitting around letting people that are not in the church talk about the church. And I don't mean Life Center in particular. I mean the body of Christ. Center, you have no right. And, and when you sit there in a public setting and you spew that stuff out, you've joined the enemy's camp. You could put a gun to my head. I'm not going to speak against the body of Christ. It's the bride of Christ. That's right. That's right. And our world, it, the, the church is not subject to the judgment and the assessment and the evaluation of the culture. Rather, it's the other way around. It is the church that must judge the culture. Yeah. The word of God came and Daniel stood up and explained to the world that God says you have been judged. Meaning, means to number. It means, it means to number. Now, I'm not sure that the, the men couldn't read the writing. It's that they couldn't what? Interpret the writing. The world can look at what they see, but they don't know what they're looking at. It's up to the church not just to read the writing, but to what? Interpret the writing. It is not enough for us to tell you, well, the Bible says this, but to make it applicable to the world in which we live. To number. That's what meaning means. To reckon. Take care. To weigh. Parson to break into or to divide. So the Bible says God has numbered your kingdom. He has numbered your kingdom. He's numbered the duration and the time of your kingdom and he has brought it to an end. Let me ask you a question. Do you think God has numbered America? You think he's numbered our days? You, do you think God has paid attention to what we have done and have not done? Two, two legislators out in, um, in, in Colorado. Both were recalled by the Colorado citizens because they voted to limit the assault weapons that people could have. And a group of people said they went too far. So in other words, never mind the dead bodies of those people in that Aurora theater. Never mind the dead bodies of those children in Newtown. Now listen to the sense of that. Now, give us our weapons, give us our assault weapons that are basically only used to kill people. So, even if that means they fall into the hands of deranged, demonic people, well, let's have them anyway. So, in other words, let's keep the weapons even though the fallout might mean the death of our children. Now, you tell me that makes sense. Let us keep the weapons. Now, I'm not, everybody who has those weapons aren't evil, but even at the risk that they might fall into the hands of demonic, demented people and children will die. Basically, they said, let them die. And if you vote against it, we'll vote you out of office. 
God bless America. And you get mad with what Jeremiah Wright said? Uh-huh. We're standing in the blood of our children and the NRA says, leave our guns alone. Uh-huh. The young man George Zimmerman took a picture, smiling picture with the gun manufacturer that killed, the gu- that killed Trayvon Martin. God bless America. Can you really say? We get mad with Jeremiah Wright. Can you really say? Uh-huh. God bless America. And the jury said, let him go free. And that fool going to end up getting killed anyway with this foolishness. So did Trayvon Martin make him punch his father-in-law in the face? So that was Trayvon Martin's fault too, huh? Well, I guess, I guess the spirit of Trayvon Martin is still bothering him. Is that what it is? Now we got mad with Jeremiah Wright because that statement might have been prophetic. And we don't like the prophetic. We like the pathetic. See, what we call prophetic is telling somebody they're going to get a new car next week. But prophetic, every prophet in the Bible got in trouble. What did, what did Ahab say to Elijah? He said, Are you he that troubles all Israel? What did Amaziah say to Amos? The land cannot bear your words. Prophets aren't popular. Prophets are disturbing. God weighs nations that he's weighing America and numbered our days. Tekel, Belshazzar had been weighed in a balance. You know what a balance is. Back in that day, they would use a balance to determine payments or determine the weight of something. A payment was to meet a certain standard. So if it did not meet that standard, it was rejected as unacceptable. Belshazzar's moral and spiritual behavior did not meet God's standard, so it was rejected. Yes, God has a scale. And so Parson, guess what? Your kingdom has been broken, taken from you. And if you read the rest of this text, that same night, the Persians came in and took the kingdom and Belshazzar was killed. That same night. And you know what scares me? That judgment on America will happen what? Suddenly. God warns and he warns. And he warns, and he warns, and then we pass the cutoff point. So even though this was a great kingdom, you're getting a chance to see what I mean by these two kingdoms. Here is this great kingdom, but then here is God's kingdom continuing to exercise authority. Now, now I'm going to come out of uh, of, uh, Daniel for just a minute and go to the book of Isaiah because I want to show you something that I want to show you how uh, transcendent God's kingdom is over the kingdoms of the world. Go to the 45th chapter of uh, of Isaiah. Go to Isaiah chapter 45, and I want you to see a word here, and I want you, that's why I want you to understand when you read the Bible, pay close attention to the words that are found in, in the Bible. Now look at this. This is, this is, this is the 45th. Now let me say, like, if, you, if you're interested in Bible history, chapter 45 is one of the reasons that scholars think that there was more than one Isaiah. Uh, scholars think that there was one Isaiah who wrote chapters 1 through 39 and another Isaiah who wrote chapters 40 through 66. They call it 1st Isaiah and 2nd Isaiah or Deutero Isaiah and years ago D.L. Moody said it's wrong to tell people about the 2nd Isaiah till they heard about the first one. <laughs> now I won't get, but, it, but let me tell you why they thought there were two. Because the prophecies that Isaiah gave were of events that would take place hundreds of years later and he was so exact they said there's no way he could have known that well he didn't have to know it God knew it I mean what's so big about that but of course the more you people the more people investigate scripture what they're really doing is saying that there's something wrong with God because in other words I can't stand here and predict something that's going to happen 200 years from now well I can if God gives it to me now, I've heard about the two Isaiahs, but I believe there was one. Jesus seemed to have thought there was one, so I kind of think like Jesus. Well, anyway, listen at this now. Listen at this. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to his what? Anointed. To Cyrus. Wait a minute. 
Wait, 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 wait. Anointing is the same designation that was used by Israel of what God placed on his kings. Cyrus wasn't saved. Cyrus wasn't a believer in one God. Silas wasn't a Jew. Cyrus was a Persian. And God calls him his what? Really? See, folks, you've got to understand when you read this book, it'll mess up your theology. Ain't nobody knowing it but us. God says, I'll anoint a pagan to do my will. I'm so much God, I'll anoint somebody who don't even know me. This man never really knew God, but the Bible said he was anointed to carry out God's purposes. I'm trying to show you how pervasive God's kingdom is. God says he is his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked path straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou, listen, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, Watch this. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. You don't know me, but I know you. And what I did for you, I raised you up because I want you to do something for my people. Cyrus, I'm going to raise you up. And when you get to be the king, I'm going to use you to make sure that Israel gets back where they're supposed to be. They're only supposed to be in Babylon 70 years. But when you take over, you're going to be the instrument that gets them back home. And I'm using you because I love my people. You don't know me. You don't go to church. You don't read the Bible. But I love Israel so much, I'm going to use you to be a blessing to them. When you're in the kingdom of God, he can use anything he wants to bless you. He didn't just anoint Cyrus, but he anointed him because he was going to be the instrument to bless the people of God. So what he was going to do, he was going to bring judgment on God's enemies. He was going to release the Jews from exile. And he didn't even know God, but God anointed him. Amen. Bless his holy name. Amen. Baby, God can use anything he wants to bless you. God can take a crooked stick and throw it a straight mile. God raised up somebody from Iran, Persia. Didn't know anything about God and wasn't trying to find it out. But everything he did was to help God's people. Yes. Oh, y'all want to go home? I'll help get you home. And I'll beat down your enemies and I'll stop those trying to hinder you. God's kingdom is so wonderful, y'all. We got to stop this little penny ante stuff we're doing. God can raise up somebody that's never laid eyes on you. We worry about who's with us. God has got folks with you you can't even dream about. God's blessing don't just have to be in this room. My God doesn't just have to use the people you see. The earth is the Lord's. Every billionaire belongs to God. Every millionaire belongs to God. All the silver and the gold belongs to God. Every doctor, every lawyer, every judge. That Listen, 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 listen. The president was about to strike uh, Syria and we don't know how that was going to turn out. And I didn't have an opinion on it one way or another. But God said, watch me work on behalf of the president. Yes. Because the Congress was going to probably give him a down vote and they were going to say that was going to hurt his presidency. So God raised up Vladimir Putin. Yes. Yeah. A Russian. Yeah. To call Assad. Yeah. And say let's get rid of those weapons. Yeah. And you don't hear what I'm saying. If God be for you. You worry about who's against you. No. I don't want to hear them about the devil being a liar. Tell me about God. Don't you tell me another word about the devil. I know somebody that bosses the devil. Yes, 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 
Put that devil in his place. The Lord will make the devil serve you. When a man's ways please the Lord, he'll make his enemies be at peace with them. Do you know why you need your enemies? Do you know why you need your enemies? Do you know why you need your enemies? Because the enemies they think you can't eat. He prepares a table in the presence. Don't run your enemies away. He don't start cooking until your enemies come there. He don't start preparing the biscuits till your enemy shows up. Don't fight your enemy, just eat. Talk about it, just eat. Quit talking about your haters, just eat. When they came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. The war should rise against me. And this will I be confident. One thing, one thing. You just get in God's house, one thing. You just get in God's confidence, one thing. Not to worry about your problem. You just get secure in God. He'll raise up friends. I'm still waiting for a billionaire to write me a check. I told Thomas, don't even show me the offer no more. I don't want to see it. I can't help it no way. If it's up, it's up. If it's down, it's down. I'm looking at another. I ain't looking at what you give. I'm looking at another. I'm checking out some money that don't come from your pocketbook. I'm looking at some money that you didn't give last Sunday because I know where some more money is. I know where some more power is. You don't hear what I'm saying? Somebody says, Cyrus, God raised up a pagan to bless, and you're going to tell me he can't bless you? You, you don't, don't shut any doors on God. That's why you can't be mean to nobody. You know who God's going to use to bless you. And quit walking around looking sad. Anybody gonna bless you looking sad, feeling sorry for yourself? I'm waiting for some billionaire to walk in life center. He said, Look at that man up there, preaching like he's crazy, singing and shouting. They said he was sad. He ain't sad. He ain't upset. He's trusting God. Let me write this man a check. You walk down the street with a smile on your face. Live, live it. This is the day the Lord hath made. You don't know where your blessing is. You don't know where your miracle is. You don't know where your open door is. Behold, I've set before you an open door. And no man, no man, no man can close it. And when he closed the door, can't nobody open it. God's anointed. Tell somebody God's anointed. Somebody you don't know to bless you. Your blessing don't have to be in this room. All the single men don't go to Life Center. All the single girls don't go to Life Center. God's got women ain't in this church. God got men don't go here. God got women in Thailand, in Venezuela, in Brazil. Acting like that person that left you is the last person to lie, baby. God made a whole lot more just like you. Maybe even better than you. Don't, don't get me started. Don't get me started. Don't worry about anybody. Let them go. Let them go. God made some more. Go on if you're going to go. Somebody's going to appreciate me one day. Treat me right. I might have to teach you to speak English, but that's okay. Bonjour. Hello. Au revoir, goodbye. <laughs> Come and stay still, say whatever that means. I, 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 I'll teach you English, I'll teach you, I'll teach you. <laughs> Cyrus was anointed to bless the people of God. God's kingdom, y'all, you gotta see the kingdom, you've gotta see the kingdom. Or, or you'll get too caught up in stuff that doesn't matter. I want, I want to talk about that Sunday. You get so caught up in things that don't matter, you'll miss the kingdom. You know what Satan's biggest weapon against the saints is? It's not sin as much as it is distractions. You'll get that later. See, <laughs> let me tell you about sin. The devil doesn't need to use sin. You use that yourself. When a man is tempted, he's drawn away of his own lust. I don't need the devil to tempt me to sin. I got that in me. I was born with that. And then, uh, right? 
no, no, see, uh, uh, no, no. Uh, see, see, I don't need to see a pretty woman to lust after one. You'll get that later. I think about him when I don't see him. I think about him if I was blind. I can, oh, I, I can imagine. I can imagine. Around the sun, the earth knows she's revolving, and the rosebuds know the blooming early May. That boy can't see, but he sees something. How could you sing the night time at the right time? You know something. The night time is the right. He sees something. So what the devil does come after those is that distractions and detours and discouragement. That's where he comes at you at. Because he wants to get you off message and off base and thinking the wrong thoughts and worrying about things that don't matter. Now in Daniel chapter 2, okay, I'm sorry, Daniel, got to get up, Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2, I want you to see something else. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And Nebuchadnezzar had this dream in Daniel chapter 2. And I'll describe the dream to you in just a moment, but I can, I can, but here again, he has this dream, and he, he, he called, I'll, I'll just summarize these verses for you, he called his magicians and soothsayers to, first of all, to tell him what the dream was, and then to interpret it. Now that's kind of tough. It would have been easier to say, I'll tell you the dream and you do what? He said, no, tell me what I dreamed, and then interpret it. They said, oh, great sire, we can't do that. He said, well, you better if you want to keep your head. And he said, well, and they said, look, he said, I'm getting sick of you guys. You're just buying time. If you really are who you say you are, tell me what I dreamed and tell me what it means. So they couldn't, and the king said, fine. All wise men in Babylon are to die. Everybody's to die. You're all, you're all a bunch of phonies, a bunch of tricksters. You're all going to die. So the Bible says when they got ready to put him to death, Daniel said, tell the king to chill. Now you're out here killing everybody because your fake preachers can't handle it. There is somebody who can do it. So I just summarized the first few verses. Then Daniel answered verse 20 and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom and might are what? Yeah. Are his. And he changes times and the seasons. He removes kings. You see it? Mm -hmm. He sets up kings, yes. gives wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. He reveals the deep secret things. He knows what's in the darkness. And the light dwells with him. Lord have mercy. That's good preaching stuff. I thank thee. I thank and praise thee, O God, of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now that we, what we desire of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. I want you to go back, if you will. Look, look, at, look at how, the, how this man understood the kingdom of God. Now remember, Babel, uh, Daniel is a captive in Babylon. He's a prisoner of war in Babylon, 1,500 miles from home, and yet God has exalted him in another kingdom. You getting it? Yeah. See, Daniel, Daniel wasn't exalted back in Jerusalem. Daniel went to a land 1,500 miles away, and there God exalted him. Joseph wasn't a ruler in Israel. Joseph was the prime minister of Egypt. I'm trying to show you where God works, y'all. He just works in Egypt. That's who we are. This is not our kingdom. This is the other man's kingdom. But God has exalted us in another man's kingdom. Daniel understood that. He sets up kings. He gives wisdom. So here's the interpretation. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw a giant statue with a head, a, a head, arms, belly, thighs, feet, and toes. Okay, the head was fine gold of this great statue. The torso was silver. The belly and thighs were bronze. The legs were iron, and the feet were iron and clay. Now listen, <clears throat> what's about to happen here is critical because Daniel, I'm sorry, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that went from 
from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, which was 600 years before Christ, all the way to the second coming of Christ. So this, 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 this dream covered, we don't know how many years it covered, why? Because Christ hasn't come yet. Now remember I told you, Daniel prophesied up to the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the first time. He completely skipped the church age and everything else Daniel said has to do with the end time. Daniel prophesied nothing about the last 2,000 years or the time we know as the church. He came to Jesus, first coming, the death of the Lord, cut it off, and went to the second coming. That's how you interpret Daniel. So let's look at this. The head of the statue was gold. That was the description of the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of kings. He was the master king. He was the great king. Notice how the metals decrease in value as they go down. Watch this. But they get stronger. But they, get, but they decrease in value. He was the great king. Nebuchadnezzar was the great king. He had this unbelievable kingdom of Babylon. The kingdom lasted about uh, 87 years. He was known for, he was, he was, although his father had actually done much of the conquest, but he was given dominion, power, glory, and might from God. That was the first kingdom. After Babylon would come the second kingdom or the silver kingdom with the Medes and the Persians. They were people from Iran. Persia is Iran. That kingdom lasted about 200 years. The belly and thighs were the kingdom of Greece. It was a young man named Alexander. They call him Alexander the who conquered the known world. This young man conquered from Greece all the way to India and died of alcoholism at 33. This young man spread Greek philosophy and Greek language and Greek architecture all over the known world. So anytime you hear the word Hellenistic, it doesn't mean somebody causing hell. It means Greek. So he spread the Greek culture, even the, new, even the Old Testament, which was written in Hebrew, was translated into Greek, which we call the Septuagint, on which the King James Bible is based. This young man conquered the whole earth. The legs in iron were Rome. Now, iron is stronger than bronze, silver, and gold. Rome lasted a long time. Rome lasted from 63 B.C. to 419 A.D. It was a mighty conquering force. Old man Taylor said the Romans conquered everywhere the mind of man thought it worthwhile to conquer. From the Tiber and the Rhine and the Euphrates to, to, to from Africa to India to, 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 to Britain to Germany. The imprimatur of Rome was a mighty conquering force. So look at the kingdoms that would rise. And Israel would have to deal with all of these kingdoms. Now, the other kingdoms in the middle, after Babylon, after Persia, you don't read about in Scripture because you have that 400 years of silence. Malachi stopped prophesying around 400 uh, uh, B.C., and God didn't speak again until the new era had come in. So these were the kingdoms they had to deal with. Now here's some interesting. Now the feet of the statue were, were ten toes of iron and clay. Now listen, listen. When you go from the two legs, <clears throat> which were Rome, and Rome ended up being split into east and west. When you left the two legs of Rome, you have these ten toes of iron and clay. Those ten toes represent the ten kingdoms that will exist during the time of the end and the Antichrist. Now here's the problem. All of these metals, gold, silver, bronze, iron, are fine, but you cannot mix iron and clay. Even if you boil them in the same cauldron, they won't mix. So there will come ten kingdoms in the end time. Ten kingdoms. Now we're talking all the way from, from Rome in which Jesus was born until the time of the Antichrist. So now we've skipped onto another period in human history. Now I want to show you something. He dreamed this dream. 
He dreamed this dream, but I want to show you what's going to happen with this dream. Now listen, go to chapter 2 and look at verse uh, verse, um, verse 42. And as of the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so that the kingdom, watch this, shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with murray clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Look at this. Look, look at this, y'all. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a what? Kingdom. Set up a kingdom, which shall never. Babylon fell. Persia fell. Greece fell. Rome fell. But the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath made known to thee king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. He dreamed this dream and saw this gigantic humongous statue gold, silver, brass, iron, iron and clay but then he saw a stone that was hewed out the mountain without hands. And that stone went rolling down the street, as it were, yes, sir. hit the statue, yes, sir. and the doggone things collapsed into dust. Ah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, men have set up their kingdoms. Men have done their things. God knows it. Men are doing what they do and saying what they say, but I see a stone. I see a stone hewn out the mountain, not made with hands, tearing down world systems. I ain't worried about this world. I know a stone is coming. I'm not worried about the might of Russia and China and America. I see a stone. Oh my God. God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A, stone. a stone. That stone is Jesus. Yes, sir. That stone, and when the new kingdom comes, it ain't going nowhere. Yes. And he shall reign forever yes. and ever yes. and ever and ever. Yes. Don't you love him? Yes. Don't you know he's in charge? Yes, Rest better, saints. Rest better. Yes. Sleep at night. Yes. Don't worry about your bills. Don't worry about your enemies. Don't worry about the Tea Party. Don't worry about the Republicans, the Democrats, the Dixiecrats, the Bishopcrats, the Deaconcrats, and nobody else. You trust in God. He's got this thing under control. And when he gets ready, it's all coming down. And when it comes down, he's going up. And that's exactly what's going to happen to you. As this world fails, you're going to flourish. As this world receives, you're going to come forth. As this world gets poorer, you're going to get richer. As this world loses out, you're going to gain. Yes, you've been down. Yes, you've been tried. But as you've suffered and struggled and tried, God says, I'm going to reverse this thing. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. You shall rise up. You shall have your day. You shall see the glory of God. And the very people that made fun of you are going to bow down and say, surely the Lord is with you. You just hold on a little while longer. The stone is coming. And it's going to dismantle all this stuff. And he shall reign forever and ever. And we shall reign with him. Well, I've got one more thing next week to say out of Daniel. That I'm going to leave this brother alone. But, just as, but it's another vision that he saw that's uh, a little similar. But I'll just kind of show you the, the little variation of that other vision. But you know what? You, you get it now? You see, this kingdom, God's kingdom. And his last thing I'll say, now God's kingdom is coming. But it's working right now. God's kingdom is coming in full expression. But don't you lose this. It's working right now. And that's the kingdom that you're in. Yes.